Uh, we also have Francesco Rulli joining us. Francesco, you are the CEO of Querlo and pioneer of digital twins for key corporate roles. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about your background as well? My background is very uh, diverse. Uh, originally, I started a, actually a fashion company with John Malkovich uh, back in the early 2000s. And at the end of our relationship, he inspired me to launch Filmonix. It was an online film distribution platform it's established in 2005 at the same time of YouTube. Uh, we grew very rapidly. We understood very rapidly the importance of how you manage data. And uh, we decided from a philanthropic perspective to, to fund and um, establish 13 schools in Afghanistan to empower young women in education. And then uh, that from that, in 2013, we introduced payments in Bitcoin. We had over 20,000 young women there. The, so the decentralizing uh, the opportunity for banking and banked was very important for us. And in 2016, because of uh, bureaucratic pressure, we transformed into a project into chatbots. And that's how we go into the world of uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, our main moves, ironically, has been for philanthropic reasons, and then we found ourselves being um, some of, one of the first companies in 2016 building conversational digital twins and chatbots for corporations. That's where we are. So Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, raised a number of eyebrows uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he was being uh, interviewed for a book, and uh, someone, someone brought up the topic of creative work, right? And Sam Altman responds that 95% of what marketers use agencies strategists and creative professionals for is going to be automated away for free in five years. Uh, this raised quite a lot of out eyebrows uh, across the industry, and the article was widely cited. So let's, go, let's jump right to the panel, right? There, there's been a lot of buzz about this prediction. Um, you know, uh, understandably, there's a lot of uh, livelihood here. I wanted to gauge um, everyone's uh, thoughts on this very provocative statement, uh, and also, do you think it's it's realistic this ninety five percent figure? I think Altman is following the footsteps of many people trying to announce things to make news. All right, yeah, we could go to one hundred percent for what I know, <laughs> but then uh, we will have a little problems with each other, right? And um, I think that uh, a cautious uh, progression, progression and growth of implementing artificial intelligence is important. I've been talking to companies since 2016 about building very simple deterministic or NLU-powered chatbots, and, and people have been looking at me like if I had three heads. And I, I just told everybody, actually I was at the European Parliament in December, and I brought as an example what happened on 2001 Space Odyssey, where the astronauts thought that how 9,000 they could just turn them off, and then they ended up dead. So, you know, there are certain steps that you have to take when you go into the world of artificial intelligence, which you have to be very conscious from an ethical perspective, as it was written there, but also from a functional perspective of what you're dealing with. And um, last week I attended uh, the presentation of the book, Our Biggest Fight, by Frank McCourt and uh, Michael Casey. Michael is a dear friend. He, had a, he was audacious to put me in the preface of his first book, The Age of Cryptocurrency, because of the work we did in Afghanistan. And when I heard and actually read that, the following days the book, I really realized that our priority now is about how ethically we understand how this black box work, because we are putting at risk our entire ecosystem and our children to start with. So mm -hmm. That's where I want to start. Okay. So I want to continue our discussion here around digital twin technology, around um, digital co-workers, Francesco. Um, so you don't know this, but I've been in communication with your digital twin. Um, before this briefing, I logged on to your site. Uh, I told your digital twin, hi, you'll be on a panel with me in uh, a few days. What's a, what's a question that I can ask you? And so your digital twin told me to ask you, um, <laughs> how can digital twins enhance the effectiveness and productivity of employees? in key corporate roles. So a little bit of a softball, because you knew it was coming, but um, I'd love to know your thoughts here. So I, I receive about 50 conversations a day now on this, so this actually skipped. Uh, I didn't get the notification on that, so <laughs> it's good. I want to clarify, my digital twin is built about uh, around my life uh, biography. It doesn't talk about family, religion, or politics. And it does have different opinions than I do about certain matters. I, I was 
participating in the North American Championship of Sailing last October, when I got back off the boat on the third day, I didn't do very well, uh, had uh, dealt with 39 conversations, 715 sites, and three of those became clients later on. So it has been very useful. We started our venture to shadow teachers in Afghanistan. Then we went into the corporate side, but obviously also being an Italian uh, company in terms of uh, our developers are there. We, we created the artificial intelligence of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and many different uh, historical characters. And we saw that the potential of conversational artificial intelligence is incredible. Um, but it has to be taken one step at a time. So for example, one of our large HR clients with 19,000 employees, we created a, a digital assistant to help uh, first uh, the HR department to have the first digital assistant so that the HR department could handhold them into the right direction. Then we started building digital twins of various executives and uh, let them know that uh, the opinions could be different, right? And uh, this digital twin has been actually very useful for me um, not just to provide a, a, you know, some insights about what to do with AI, but also suggestions to me. One day someone asked my digital twin, what would you do if you find the 30 gold coins? And my digital twin answered, well, one option would be just take them and put them in the safe. The other one is look for someone who lost them. But the third option, because of your background in philanthropy, is that you look for the person who lost it you give 80% back and 20% you give it to a charity of your choice or combined choice. And that was the third option I could have never thought about. And that's when I thought, oh, I'm slowly learning from my own digital twin because it's giving me options tailored around my life and uh, my, my beliefs that actually work for me. But I also have to be very careful because one thing that was missing from that resume in the experience section who has this a generative AI been working with in the past? Who is this generative AI faithful to, all right? And uh, going back to doing our due diligence, we have to look with less enthusiasm at this black box that is generative AI and be a little bit more concerned about what happens to the information that comes in and comes out and how we treat those information. That's my five cents. Right, definitely. I, and I, I'm sure that many people in leadership roles and executive roles have had that thought of, I wish there were two of me. I wish I could just multiply myself and get all this done. What's your vision for the future of what the capabilities of a digital twin could, could do as an assistant or as um, an, an equal partner? So we build 17,000 different uh, solutions. In the last year, we have been focusing on uh, natural language uh, uh, generation. And I have to say, obviously, answering repetitive questions in terms of marketing communication is very useful. But we also know that if there is a nuance in the way that is answered that is different from what we expect, then nobody's going to get hurt, right? right. Uh, when you start doing uh, lead qualification and lead generation is very useful because you can turn around uh, the conversation and sometimes to switch from a uh, generative AI into NLU or deterministic to actually ask a few questions to the person across. Ironically, we know more about NLU or deterministic trees of conversations and we can protect the data more than when we do this with generative AI. And the third part in which I think it's very important uh, is uh, to not use the word replacing people, but actually augment people, help them uh, to improve their lives and uh, make their day a little bit more useful, right? So uh, we don't use tool boots anymore almost. You know, I came from Italy in 1990 and we already had not tall boots in most uh, exits and it took me here a little longer. So I'm like, all right, so let's try to use artificial intelligence to, to allow people to have better lives and okay. not replace them. What have you seen in the marketplace of, of, of how this is being used right now? Uh, and and what, what should we be uh, uh, watching out for as well? So um, Midjourney actually updated their terms of use in a much more legal uh, lease way uh, because they, they know this, this battle is coming, right? How do you manage rights? What can they use from a property? from a property perspective, an intellectual property perspective. And going back to that book I was mentioning before, it's more of a web 3.0 approach. I'm a big believer in the decentralizing information, a believer that all of us should be responsible for what our 
data and information are about. We have to be all of us less lazy, just like the astronauts. They thought that they could turn off how 9,000. They didn't realize they took them uh, whatever years to get there. And they didn't know how it was programmed. So I think we all have to take a step back. I, uh, this rush to gold, uh, it's ridiculous. You know, uh, it, it, we have to say, okay, if we're using those technologies, who are we going to impact? What are the, the artists, you know, for example, that created and they spend their entire life to create a concept and then this thing takes it away from them and there is no, this is really like, this is like a bad movie. So uh, we have to step back a little bit and that we have to be truthful to ourselves and be responsible for our own data whenever we input any information. It doesn't matter what's your favorite color or it doesn't matter what's your opinion about something or a law. Now, to close this, it's very interesting, when I was invited to the, the European Parliament, I criticized the Parliament because the Europeans make it too, so hard for startups to operate, right? But ironically, because there is not that huge financial interest on the other side of the ocean, so basically they don't have a Google, they don't have a Microsoft, they don't have an Apple, they don't have a, a Facebook or an Instagram, they don't have that $10 trillion generated by those industries here. So now they can actually create some of those uh, requirements. And GDPR was one of the first steps. Painful to deal with, but going forward, I think if we leverage Web 3.0 and we're more responsible, we're going to find the right balance between this new creativity and the what we deserve in terms of protections. I, I believe everything has to start from education perspective. In, since high school, college, People have to be educated of how to use those tools. I was today with one of my clients at a college near Venice called H Farm, where we were discussing the impact of uh, solutions like Sora on the people that graduate from the school and they do animations, for example, for movies that we all watch together. And um, I think it's uh, just like we discussed how AI has to augment uh, the work of, of uh, employees, has to augment the work of uh, 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 students. I spoke at this high school actually in Bronxville last week about entrepreneurship, and uh, yesterday the professor, Brian Holling, was telling me how they are creating a panel in, within the school to discuss how you handhold the students into the use or no use of artificial intelligence. And I, I offer my service, say, listen, I volunteer, but you have to allow them to understand that the qualities, also the responsibilities, as we mentioned before, of those technologies. So SARA is a great tool, but it has to be useful uh, it has to be used in a mindful way, and uh, those people that created it, they also have to make sure that they don't take advantage of the information that are going to be used within this tool. So yes, maybe there is a saving that we can pass over to the clients, but from an intellectual property perspective, you have to self-guard your agency or, and the interest of the client itself. But everything starts from education building up, I think. Uh, Francesco, what's your takeaway from today's discussion, particularly as it relates to generative AI and the creative industries? Uh, I, I believe that we have to keep humans in the center, the decision making, and the full benefits of this AI it has to be not necessarily financial, but it has to be uh, to make people's life better. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, in, an artist creating a new idea, or is the client, or is the person crossing the street here on 42nd Street now. Uh, the goal is to, to keep people in the center of this conversation. We, we, we can't just uh, let go this responsibility because eventually things can escalate in the wrong direction. You know, uh, they call it uh, hallucinations. Um, I don't think it's justifiable having hallucinations. It's not justifiable having black boxes. Um, we worked for years with a natural language understanding where they were very clear infrastructure where we can see where the information is going and how they're being dealt with. And suddenly everything was closed to our eyes. The irony of calling it open AI, and then it's the last thing is, is, is open AI is crazy to me. But um, you know, it's our job as humans to be responsible for that. And obviously the creativeness and the emotions will leverage. We build some deterministic chatbots to uh, assess depression and anxiety. And why? It's because actually the test for depression and anxiety is like 10 questions, right? And uh, sometimes life is not that complicated. But then, obviously, you have to give nuances. The eloquence of those language models is intriguing, but it's also a little dangerous because uh, we have to be sure that uh, what we see is real and it doesn't damage uh, the reputation.
representation, for example, of an artist or the time involved by a team of creating it. And then we end up, all of us, into a lawsuit because we didn't know where the information was coming from, the design and the, the concept. Mm.